So I have with me a familiar face on children's television during the 80s, 90s and the noughties, including being part of the how-to team for an amazing 16 years. It's Gareth Jones. Hello. Hey, Jack. How are you, man? I'm not too bad, thank you. Yourself? I'm good. I'm very pleased that you said the noughties there because um, the trouble with being a children's television presenter is that people think that your career stops when they stop watching children's <laughs> television. And you're right, How did carry on until 2005. So most people, if they sort of mature out of children's television, sort of 15, 16 years old in the mid-90s, assume that I never made any programmes again because I carried on for another 10 years. So well identified. Good start, sir. No problem. Well, actually, I, I pretty much watched How To until the very end, so I do remember the uh, the, the final series. Wow. Yeah, it was... Um... It was unique, if I remember, the last series of How, in that we left the studio for one item every in every episode. We, were, we filmed How to in Glasgow, and the Glasgow Science Centre had opened up not far away from uh, our studios, and it's such a good resource. Uh, we thought we'd tap into them, and I seem to remember doing the thing about... Um, recumbent bicycles in the last series which would have been difficult in the studio but of course you can get out and about uh, and we did which was uh and it wasn't necessarily in my opinion the right thing to do for how to be honest because the beauty of how was that we could go anywhere in time and space within the studio because we had this white um almost like a crucible, you know, the, the house studio was a, a white infinity psych, as we say, that sort of a, a, a white screen or cloth behind us that was lit very brightly, so you couldn't see how deep it was. So if we wanted to um, tell a story of something which happened in the Gobi Desert in 1948, Fred would do the introduction, walk away from the table, and you go to a, a white area of the studio, and all you have to do is put a a cactus, a cartoon drawing of a cactus in the middle of that white set, and bang, you're transported there. So the, the beauty of the Harris Studio was it was kind of like a crucible. It was a focal point in which you could go to anywhere in the world or even off the world within the studio without having to leave the confines of the studio, which, frankly, between you and me, kept costs down, and children's television never had a big budget. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember it very well, and uh, I remember... Uh all the little demonstrations you did with all the oversized props and stuff like that. It was, it was very, I suppose, eye catching as well. And, and a, a different way of, of making something that could be quite boring fun. Well, yeah, that's, you've nailed it there. I, absolutely. We, um, identified a rather Tim Edmonds, who was one of the people responsible for bringing how back as how to the series, which I presented. Uh, identified that we should have a device in the programme. We, we called it the Bastard Scale, or Bastard Scale, because these people were from the south of England. And um, traditionally, How, which was a TV show which was around in the 1960s, would do lots of tabletop Hows. Um, and one classic example was a How called How Do You Make a Tank Out of a Cotton Reel? And uh, it was a, a, a little wind-up toy involving a matchstick, a rubber band and a cotton reel and a, a bit of a candle uh, sliced as a, a washer. And it's a wind-up toy that you play with on the tabletop and you know, it moves around like a tank. It's a cool little thing. Uh, but we figured on how to that wasn't going to be entertaining enough unless we did it on the bastard scale. So the item would start with us doing the item on the desktop and then... I'd say, yeah, but that's not really what I'm here to show you. This is how you make a tank. Uh, and I would build a large-scale version of that using a six-foot cable drum, uh, a scaff bar about two metres long, and some industrial bungee, wind it up and let it go across the studio. And suddenly you've got something that was interesting initially, being properly dramatic. And I think that was part of the appeal of how. And uh, It's great that you remembered that. Yeah, I think as well, a, a show that comes to mind that was very similar, which I think I think had some of the same production team, was Art Attack, because Neil would do a little version of something and then go, well, let, let's blow it up to a big size. So it was very similar of making something that could be quite not that interesting on screen, made interesting. 
yeah, no, not only um, some of the same production team, but practically all the same production team. Tim Edmonds uh, was the man who conceived Art Attack with Neil Buchanan. Uh, Tim uh, produced the first series of How To for TVS in, in the South. Then TVS, um, after three years, lost their franchise. So How To went up to Scotland. And Tim formed an independent production company to make Art Attack. So it was actually the first three series of How were shot in the same studio as Art Attack using the same Infinity Psych, that white wall, and uh, many of the same paints, cameramen, props builders, many of the same people. Yeah, uh, Art Attack and How were sort of brother and sister, really. And two great shows. Yeah, Tim was a very, very, is a very, very, very clever man, uh, a man who understands his audience very well. He had children and knew how to make programs that would appeal to his children, and that was the, the success of, of How, I think. Um, so I've got to kind of start before How anyway. Uh, I wanted to ask you, growing up, did you aspire to be in television and were you always into science and technology? Um, I wanted to be a rock and roll star. That was um, my my ambition. Either that or the first Welshman on the moon. I don't think I wanted to be a television presenter, but my heroes were all on television, of course. Um, I was a Slade fan. It, it's wonderful talking to someone from the West Midlands, the black country. Uh, for me, that's, you know, the, the holy land. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, anywhere connected to Noddy Holder, Jimmy Lee, Don Powell and, and Dave Hill from, from Slade is important to me. Without Slade, uh, I would never have got on television. Uh, you know, I learned to play guitar. I used to, before I could play guitar, I used to mime in my garden holding um, uh, a tennis racket with me four mates pretending to be Slade when I was at 10 years old um my ambitions to be a, a, a pop star got me into rock and roll and it was rock and roll ultimately that got me into television but my heroes as uh, as a, a young man as a child were the presenters of tomorrow's world really um people like william woolard and james burke who hosted many of the uh, bbc coverage of the the moon landings uh, which happened, you know, I'm old enough to remember the moon landing. It was uh, 1969, I was eight years old, and I watched it live. Um, so I'm a child of the space age. I was born in 1961, so science, engineering, and technology was a huge part of everybody's culture in that period. And My, my father was an electronics engineer. He'd identified at the end of the war that um, uh, electronics was going to be the future. So I grew up in a house where... Um, you know, my dad built and repaired televisions. We designed and flew radio-controlled aircraft together. My passion was science, engineering, and technology, which is why um, when I got into rock and roll, I actually ended up being a roadie because I knew more about the technology than I knew about the music. So uh, I was useful as a roadie, and I went from being a roadie to being a, a television presenter uh, via a, a, a circuitous series of events really so it was yeah I, I never set out to be a tv presenter uh, i wanted to be a pop star or an astronaut but you know very often at least you've got an ambition it, it will take you on a journey and that journey might not be where you actually plan to go but it will take you somewhere i was very lucky definitely very very lucky yeah there's a lot of luck in it being at the right place at the right time and uh, being given opportunities by people who see what you can do and then you know, getting away with it. I always thought I've been getting away with it. You know, you go for a, a screen test and they say, yeah, you've got the job. Wow, I, I got away with it. And then you get a TV series and you do the first program and you think, wow, I got away with it. And then you get a commission to do a second series of that series. You think, wow, I got away with it again. And here I am, uh, where are we now? Uh, the 2018, some 33 years later, still getting away with it you know well well done to you <laughs> it's just it's a series of flukes that's all it is yeah i'm sure it isn't you're a very talented presenter well i get lots of support you know uh, you can't do it on your own you know, you're given a brief um you're given the opportunity to explain things and you're given the uh, the, the the media through which to do it and an audience and if you take what you do seriously, you should succeed. You know, if you fail 
at that level, then you probably haven't tried hard enough. And I was, I was quite tenacious. I'm quite, quite disciplined, you know, good sort of Welsh Methodist work ethic. You know, if I'm given a task to do it, I will over deliver. And I think that's what's carried me through. But, you know, I, 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 I was lucky. I rode a wave. I got into television thanks to technology. It was the rise of satellite television in 1985, the beginnings of satellite television that provided um, a whole group of opportunities where there hadn't been previously. You know, there were dozens of new channels appearing. Previously, there had only been four channels in the UK. And so with all these channels emerging, they needed what is known as talent. I hate that word, but, you know, the people who appear on screen. Um, the shout went out, you know, we need people to host music programs. And uh, I heard about um, a new TV channel called Music Box in 1985, which is rather like um, early MTV. It was a forerunner of MTV in, in Europe, in the UK, uh, a music channel playing music videos and they just wanted someone to introduce the music videos and my background um having been a roadie for five years meant that i knew a lot of the acts who were releasing records and i worked for them as a roadie so um i could sit there and say something about the video that wasn't a script i hadn't been handed a script by someone else and told what to say i had stories of my own to share so i was qualified without realizing i was empowered to be in this position. So I got a job as a music presenter, a VJ, a video jockey for Music Box. And on the back of that, um, got the opportunity to um, move into children's television when Janet Street Porter had seen me hosting a music program, a hosting Music Box, and uh, thought I might be good for her new Saturday morning show, Get Fresh. Uh, and so screen tested me. And again, I got the job. I, you know, I, kept having these screen tests and kept uh, kept getting the job it, it, it seemed easy at the time but I uh, I think 30 people screen tested for the music box job that I got and the, the get fresh job I did um, I think they interviewed dozens and dozens of people and I think about a dozen of us were, were screen tested but get fresh was different get fresh was sort of about a, a chemistry where they put a group of people together and were looking for a group of people who got on who would become a team. And of that first tranche of people who were screen tested, I was the only one picked. And then they found Charlotte Hindle and thought, oh, we've got to have Charlotte. And they were right. She was tremendous. And uh, as luck would have it, Charlotte and I got on brilliantly. And that was the core unit of Get Fresh uh, put together, really. It's about chemistry. It's often about whether people get on or not, because on television, you, you can tell that, you know, it, it bleeds through the screen whether these people are pals or not. You know, you, you, they say kids can smell it. You know what I mean? There's an innate, um, unspoken truth that kids are sensitive to, I think. Definitely. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask, actually, um, I'm, I've got to admit, Get Fresh was a little bit before my time. What was Get Fresh? What actually happened in it? Get Fresh was a live, uh, very live, uh, two and a bit hour Saturday morning TV programme which ran on ITV between 1986 and 1988. So we did th um, three live series uh, in those three years, 86, 87 and 88, and also two studio series in 87 and 88, which were shown on Sunday mornings. They were pre-recorded, but the Saturday show was live as hell. And it was uh, a location program. And the premise was this uh, spacecraft, or starship, you might say, uh, called the Millennium Dustbin, uh, <laughs> named by a fan of the program, a viewer, uh, would land somewhere, uh, you know, Newcastle, um, uh, Carlisle, uh, Newquay, Glasgow, Cardiff, all over the country. Um, and the ship would land, we'd come out, and we'd present items as though we were discovering about the region. So we do items about how you make clotted cream in, uh, in Devon or in Scotland. We do the history of the bagpipes, and a huge pipe band would turn up. And we'd have large outdoor events, um, uh, you know, BMX demos and bands would come and play. Uh, we had big audio dynamite. We had public image. We had uh, 
uh, Susie and the Banshees, lots of 80s bands. And like many, and we show cartoons, of course, as well. So you do a live sort of 12-minute section of the program, introduce a cartoon which lasted 20 minutes, and then have 20 minutes to prepare for the next live section of the program. And people used to turn out. We did a show in Edinburgh where 3,500 people crowded around the Millennium Dustbin. Uh, it was presented by me, Charlotte Hindle, and uh, an alien puppet called Gilbert the Alien, who is one of the best things that ever happened to me on television. Gilbert was this very unpleasant, snotty alien, um, green, had snot dribbling from his nose. It was actually KY Jelly. And he was revolting. Ah, kids loved that. You know, kids like horrible stuff. And we didn't have Gilbert on the first series of Get Fresh. He joined for the second and third series. And when Gilbert joined, wow, the show took off. On the first series of Get Fresh, it was presented by me, Charlotte Hindle, uh, an actor called Jan Samarco, who'd played Adrian Mole in a TV adaptation of the Adrian Mole, Secret Diary of Adrian Mole who was only a very young man at the time, I think he was about 15 or 16. And uh, the Vicious Boys, this sort of uh, street comedy act who did very physical stuff, and they were tremendous. But they didn't want to do Get Fresh after the first series because they had their own things going on. So they left, and we replaced them with Gilbert. And Gilbert really helped the series take off. I suddenly noticed, in those days, I was called Gaz Top. That was my nickname that I'd gleaned when I was, uh, gained when I was a, a roadie, and uh, all roadies have nicknames, and uh, it stuck with me on television, and I used to walk down the road, um, people would say, all right, Gaz, where's Gilbert, and I realized suddenly people were talking to me, and people had something to talk to me about, that, that they'd noticed Gilbert, the chemistry on the show had really um, worked out, and that uh, Get Fresh was becoming a hit. I and mean, we used to get an audience of about six and a half million people for a two-hour Saturday morning show, uh, which spanned all ages. We'd start very early in the mornings with items for very small children, you know, and towards the, you know, we'd start at 9.25 and we'd come off air about quarter to 12, by which point we were doing interviews with bands and they would be playing songs you know so it went from being a children's program a very young children's almost preschool show early in the morning hence the premise of arriving in a spaceship and then towards the end of the morning it was almost like a teenager's show. well it was a teenager's show so it was more than just a program it straddled um a whole generation or a generation of children it was very very successful but uh, i did it for three years and during the third year of Get Fresh, I started to notice that we were repeating ourselves. We were doing the same items, not only the same sort of items, but the same items again that we'd done as we went around the country. And I, I thought, well, I'm getting a bit bored with this. And if I'm getting bored with this, and the audience at home will be getting bored with this. So uh, I elected to leave Get Fresh. And... Uh, when I, I was, you know, like Paul Weller from the jam, you've got to split the band before the band become boring. You know, that was my policy. It was a bit of a punk. Uh, and when I announced uh, I wanted to do that, um, Mike Forte, the producer of the series, said, uh, well, I, I think it would be wrong to replace Gaz on the program and put someone else in. So we'll call an end to get fresh. And it finished after three years. It was replaced by a program called The Ghost Train, a very similar sort of premise where they um, toured the country, but it was a bit more of a, a drama, a live drama. Uh, and it was very good, but I don't think it was quite as um, original and as anarchic uh, and energetic uh, as Get Fresh. Um, so, yeah, I left Get Fresh, and then within uh, two years I'd got, well, within 12 months I'd got How To, luckily, um, just by chance, I think. Oh, I don't think it's by chance. I, I think you're a good presenter. <laughs> there the, uh... are lots of good presenters you know uh it's just uh, it's it's about networking i mean the, the truth is that the producer of um get fresh uh was janet street porter she was the executive producer but the series producer on the first series was that man tim edmonds i think again. it's um uh, a case of who you know not what you know really yeah well it's yeah it's kind of like um trusted suppliers um, Janet had spotted me 
introduced me to Tim. Tim and I got on. Tim said, yeah, I think this guy will be uh, useful for the program, but he's got a heck of an ego. We're going to have to sit on that. True, he said that. Uh, but I got on very well with Tim, and we worked for a year on on how that Tim left how to be um, uh, to return to his job at TVS, and uh, and when the opportunity came up at TVS to make how Tim, because he'd worked with me for a year, knew about my background in science, engineering, and technology, and invited me to come on to how to. So uh, and so yeah, I guess like trusted supplier, Tim knew that I would deliver, uh, and so I was a. Uh, yeah, it's quite a, a safe bet that I'd be all right for how, I suppose. It's about networking, I suppose. Definitely. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask, actually, um, just before we go on to how to, in the interim part between Get Fresh and How To, you also presented the continuity links on CITV, didn't you? That's right, yeah. The, um, the call came, I remember. It was right at the very end of Get Fresh, the first series. We were in um, Plymouth, I think. Plymouth Ho, and um, the call came from my manager at the time, Peter Buckle, to say that Children's ITV were interested in, in me uh, recording some links for them to introduce the programs, and uh, because I really didn't know what I was going to do after Get Fresh, I, I accepted straight away, and uh, we used to record the links in blocks in those days. It was all done in uh, a studio called Carlton Studios in uh, St. John's Wood, where I would go in for three days, I think, and in three days record all the links for something like a month's television. So I wouldn't see any of the programs that I was introducing. I might be sent to VHS the night before and have an opportunity to scan, scan them briefly just to look at them quickly. But I would be introducing stuff blind and sort of making up things to say and reacting to letters that had been sent in. It was very much down to the presenter. You know, you, when you're making television in volume, and I return to that theme that there's not a lot of money in children's television, so... The only way to make it possible is to turn it over quickly with a low budget. So that means very often there aren't resources for script writers and it's down to the presenter to make television out of nothing. And my, my background in cable television uh, at Music Box, cable and satellite, where the resources were even more limited, meant that I was quite used to that. So by the time I got to ITV, where the budgets were greater... I was I was quite useful, you know. I, I I brought something to the party. I always say to people when you're a presenter, it's like turning up at a party. You can't just turn up and say, "Where's the drink?" You got to bring a bunch of bottles with you. And uh, I I like to think I brought a lot of ideas with me. Fantastic stuff. Uh, I was surprised actually. You said uh, it was filmed in St John's Wood. I thought it was Birmingham Children's ITV. Later, later on, on, it was yes. Um, uh, when it went live. It was commissioned by uh, Central Television, who had the franchise for the West Midlands ITV, uh, when ITV was a number of small separate companies before it was united into ITV.com, which was the um, basically when Granada Television and Carlton, the two largest ITV franchise holders, combined and then absorbed all the other little regional ITV companies. Um, uh, until then, they were separate firms. And, uh, yeah, initially when it was pre-recorded, it was all done in London uh, because Carlton were a production company uh, who gained the franchise. So they owned studios in London. And eventually when CITV went live, they moved to Central Television's um, transmission suites in uh, in Gas Street, I think it was called. In, I know it wasn't Gas Street. What was it? It was before Gas Street. But Broad in, Street. In, in Birmingham. Uh, and I then I did another session for them there as well. I recorded a... Uh, I, I didn't record, actually. I did some live stuff there. When you do live links, it's very different because you do get to see the programs and you're introducing them in real time. It's a different sort of skill. You know, um, it, it's it's the best laxative in the world, live television. I bet it is. I couldn't do it. I bet you could. It's all about preparation. You just work up to it, do your homework, and when they say go, start speaking. You could do it. Might give it a go one day. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask as well, um, just for those who don't know, how to 
A lot of people who remember the show think it was called that because they think it was short for How To Do Something. But it, it was actually because it was a reboot, wasn't it? That it was called How To. It was a reboot of an Ex- earlier show. Exactly. You've nailed it there. Yeah. Um, I often describe it as sort of how the next generation. Uh, how um, was a television series. It was called How, not How To. How. It ran from about 1966 to 1980. And uh, it was on ITV. It started off as a regional program, not even for children, but for adults. It was on in the 10.30 slot after the news um, when the pubs used to close at 11 o'clock. And the idea was that uh, it was sort of pub tricks and facts to impress your mates at the bar in a pub. And it was so successful in the evening that they thought, oh, maybe this could be a good children's program. So they tried it as a children's program and it was very successful. And then it became a network children's program and one of the presenters of how was fred dinage he was the youngest presenter on the show and uh and he was my hero i grew up watching how of course it was that was my period of children's television and i loved fred and i loved how and then when i got the opportunity to do the follow-up the sequel to how how to um uh with fred it was unbelievable, unbelievable. This man who I'd watched on television for many, many years became initially my co-presenter, my ally, and uh, since we've known each other now uh, nearly 30 years, my great and close friend. You know, Fred and I are very good mates, even to this day. We, we speak on the phone regularly, and he often asks me when I'm going to get how back on screen, but uh, <laughs> I'm would be not great. sure if I could manage that. That would be great if it came back again. There is a possibility. I did. Um, I was involved in a pitch. I wrote uh, a treatment for how, uh, for a, a follow-up, if you like, how three. Although it wasn't called how three, I felt that was a bit inevitable. Uh, I called it how for now, um, based on the phrase that we used to say at the end of the program, which I invented, by the way. So I felt I had some ownership over that phrase. So yeah, how for now would have been a live version of how using a live audience in the studio with us of about 100 people where we would involve the people in the audience in the uh, science demos and the, the, the items that we would do and being live we could then connect to an audience people at home via Skype and they could show us their house live so it would become a more urgent vital version of how how for now a more contemporary version um, and ITV considered it very, very hard. Uh, it was about 18 months ago now. And it very nearly happened. It would have been on at 5.30 on a Saturday evening, which is an incredible slot. A family show. Not just a children's show, but a show for adults too. Uh, and ITV considered it very hard, but when it finally came down to it, they went with uh, another idea, which is very disappointing. But I was amazed. I never thought uh, I would ever be able to get how back but um, I, I, I'd been introduced to one of the commissioners at uh, ITV with the uh, express uh, instruction from Fred of getting how back so I developed this treatment for the program wrote running orders built a virtual 3D model of the studio and how we would achieve it and had a succession of meetings and it very nearly happened but I've actually heard that there is another pitch to bring how back as a children's program now where what channel i don't know and who the presenters would be i don't know i doubt if it would be me but because there is some continuity between the person who's just acquired the rights to how and the man responsible for bringing how back in the first place not tim edmonds but the guy above him uh, nigel pickard it, it's possible, it's possible I might be involved, but I'm, I'm not holding my breath because I'm, a, I'm an older man now, I'm 57 years old and uh, you, know, you don't see many people over the age of 50 on children's <laughs> television anymore. Well, fingers crossed with that. Uh, certainly, it'd be great if it came back uh, for for a new uh, a new generation. Going back to how to, obviously, you did a lot of demonstrations and experiments, and like you said, you know, you you made them as big and as bold as possible. Did any accidents or mishaps happen off the back of this? Yeah, I uh, 
I broke my arm um, diving into a ball pool. Um, I can't remember what the item was, but it was um, towards the later period of how late 90s, I think, early 2000s, where I we built this sort of ball pool set into the ground. And as I jumped in, I held my arms out and I cracked my arm. Uh, on the edge of the pool as I dived in, which was quite a hard wooden edge, and, and broke my arm. Uh, and this is on, luckily this was on the last day's filming, uh, but I did manage to finish the entire day's filming without realising I'd actually broken my arm. So I didn't have a, a a cast or anything of it. But slowly over the day, my elbow sw- swelled up, and my arm went blue you know it was awful uh, and i got treatment for it uh, on the next day but um we did um uh we did <laughs> we, we uh, it was one item which fred will never <laughs> let me forget um uh, which involved a cuttlefish um we took great care of any animals on the program. Whenever we had um, animals on the show, we made sure that they were acclimatized to the heat and the noise and the bright light of the studio and that they were fed and, you know, it, it, they weren't put under any stress or anxiety. Um, we were doing an item about cuttlefish. So we'd set up this um, aquarium in the studio, this large tank and put a cuttlefish in it. Well, actually, we put the water in and allowed the water to settle and then put the cuttlefish in. The cuttlefish had been there a couple of days in the studio, climatizing, and we had a cloth over it. And when we came to do the item, we gently moved the tank in between Fred and I on a little podium where we sat opposite or next to each other on the, the how table. And we covered it with this cloth and we came to do the item. And, uh, just before the item, I went over to the cuttlefish and I lifted up the cloth and said very quietly to the cuttlefish, OK, cuttlefish, we're going for a take now. Are you ready? And on standby and record. And we marched in and Fred did the item. How does a cuttlefish do whatever the hell was? I can't remember. And Fred pulls back the cloth covering the aquarium to reveal not a cuttlefish in an aquarium, but an aquarium full of of black ink in that moment where I whispered to the cuttlefish I must have terrified it or startled it and it had shot its load you might say because cuttlefish is part of their defense mechanism like uh, uh, like squid and octopus can squirt black ink and it had filled this aquarium it had gone from being completely transparent to being completely opaque and you couldn't see the cuttlefish and of course we couldn't do the item. So days and days of preparation for this item were wasted. We had to wheel the cuttlefish out and find an item that we could replace it with. And to this day, Fred has never <laughs> let me forget that. Stuff went wrong all the time, though. Uh, you know, we relied on props for how. We made very complicated models. We did science demos, which should work every time, but all things being considered, they never happened. I remember trying to do an item about getting goosebumps and uh, why your hair stands on end. And it worked fine in the rehearsals, which we used to rehearse in a porter cabin, a cold porter cabin. And when it came to recording it in the studio, this nice, hot, brightly lit studio, could we get my arm, uh, the hairs of my arm to stand on end? Could we get any goosebumps? No, not at all. So, yeah, lots of things that you hope don't quite work out countless things more than 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 i care to recall actually <laughs> but i'm sure it was all good fun and you all saw the funny side uh, afterwards yeah um you know the, the, you just know making a program like that uh, as i always say tgr things go wrong uh, you get that tgr and uh yeah, you, you just you have to move on to the next thing, you know, try and debug it. We had a great team of researchers, and if things weren't working, sometimes you could postpone the recording of that item, move on to the next item, and the researchers would try and debug how to make that item work, rebuild a prop, and then you'd come back and record it a couple of hours later. We used to record two episodes of How A Day, even though the show was only 20 minutes long. 
it took pretty much a whole day to rehearse and record sorry half a day to record to rehearse and record an entire program and that's you know when you're bang up to speed with a a great team of prop builders and cameramen and presenters who are well practiced at doing this it's a tricky game to get right definitely uh, but like i say i'm i'm sure uh, it, it was all good fun in the end yeah fun fun is definitely a big part of it you know we laughed and laughed and laughed and very often were told off for having too much fun <laughs> by the production team you know the spirit around the table carol Fred and I got on really well. Uh, Gail McKenna, when she joined the show, her relationship with me and Fred was even stronger. And we had most fun in the later periods of How. And I think they were our better shows, the the later episodes of, of How. You know, we've been doing it a long time. We'd gone through a middle period where the show's weren't as original as they had been. And I think we'd refound our spirit when, when Gail joined the show. And she was just great. She was so funny and such a good presenter. You know, Fred and I had huge respect for Gail. And the three of us got on. And when we finished How, we didn't know when we recorded the last program that would be the last episode we'd ever record. So we never really said goodbye to each other, uh, which is a great shame, really. But what that has done is keep us in contact you know it it doesn't feel like it's over we're just waiting to say goodbye we probably never will get a chance (laughs) actually that was something i was going to ask actually because um i remember the the gal mckenna era probably the most vividly like i started watching from around about the the mid 90s onwards i've always wondered what happened to her actually because she was on citv a lot because not only how to i think she did brilliant creatures as well and then disappeared not seen her on telly since yeah well um it's about that trusted supplier thing And the reason How To vanished, uh, along with all the other children's ITV programs of that period, was that ITV stopped making children's programs in 2005. Um, Children's ITV was uh, financed by two methods. Uh, One was the advertising around children's programs, and second was from a bursary, a pot that all the ITV programs... Uh, all the ITV franchise channels, you know, the individual channels, uh, were obliged to put into as part of their remit. So as part of their deal for making the news for Granada and all that, they had to set aside a certain amount, which went into a shared pot to make the children's programmes. And because of the dawn of satellite television, advertising was now fragmented. The advertising that used to all be on ITV was now available to lots of other channels. So the the amount of money that ITV channels were making dropped significantly when all these other channels, Sky, for instance, uh, appeared. Um, And so a lot of the, many of the ITV companies argued that they had to reduce, that they wanted to reduce the amount of money that they were paying towards children's programs. Plus, there were some, there were some uh, limits or restrictions introduced to what could be advertised on children's television. No more sugary drinks, no more chocolate crisps, for instance, those sort of things. You couldn't advertise quite rightly in children's programs because, you know, we have to be concerned about the diet of young people. And because the vast majority of the adverts around children's programs, think about it, were for chocolate crisps, pop, the amount of advertising around children's programs diminished dramatically to a point there wasn't a, to where there wasn't enough money to provide to make children's programs. ITV couldn't afford to make children's programs anymore. Went to um, uh, Ofcom, the um, watchdog for television, and said, "Look, we we would like to um, reduce our public broadcast." remit please we don't want to make children's programs for the network channel and we want to reduce our uh, commitment to religious programming for the same reason on sunday mornings Um, but we have a a plan we would like to repeat our already existing back catalogue of children's programs on a satellite channel uh, which has fewer restrictions on advertising than a, a terrestrial channel uh and and so that was it that was the end of original programming for CITV, 
It's a long way round of explaining why Gail vanished. Because, of course, Gail, all Gail's work, like mine, a vast majority of mine, was with ITV. And when all the people you work with are unemployed, no longer making programmes, there's no one to give you that work anymore. So Gail moved into um, hair and makeup, and she became a professional makeup artist for uh, some television, film work, and fashion shoots. So if you uh, open up a copy of, uh, uh, I don't know, Vanity Fair or a, a posh magazine, uh, Gail has quite possibly done the... Um, uh, the makeup for it, but not under her uh, her unmarried name, Gail McKenna, but under her married name now. So uh, you probably wouldn't recognise the name if you saw the credit. Oh, fair enough. Well, fair play to her. Yeah, I mean, you know, the people talk about uh, uh, an escape clause. You know, what's your withdrawal strategy when television ends? What do you do? And Gail had a strategy. She translated her knowledge and a passion for makeup. She always did her own makeup on how into doing it for other people, and uh, that was her escape strategy from television. Brilliant idea. So you've mentioned that it was great to work with Carol Vorderman and Gal McKenna, but there were also two other presenters. There was um, Sean Lloyd and Gal Porter. Were they good to work with as well? Yes, very funny. Um, Sean, uh, who I knew uh, before she came on How, uh, uh, only only did one year on, on How. I mean bonkers Charles absolutely bonkers i love her to bits she's nuts and she did a great job but i think anybody replacing uh carol vorderman is given a hard task you know carol's a, a tough act to follow and no matter how good Sean was and she was very good she wasn't going to look as good as Carol, who'd been an incumbent in that programme for seven years. So after a year, it was decided that Sean wouldn't carry on on the programme. And um, Gail Porter was chosen uh, to do the programme because Gail and I had done a show together for um, uh, Channel 4 schools. No, uh, ITV schools programme, which is produced by one of the producers of Howe. And he thought that... Um, uh, Gail would be Gail Porter would be a, a great uh, presenter for Hal, uh, based on what she'd done on this uh, program we'd done together. So um, Gail came and did uh, Hal for a year, but unfortunately, um, Gail was, was very ambitious, and uh, she had a, a parallel modelling career as well as a television presenting career. And as part of that modelling career, she'd done some rather revealing. Um, photos where she had a, a picture of herself uh, naked from the rear um, uh, uh, projected onto the Houses of Parliament as a, as a publicity stunt where, you know, she was 50 foot tall on the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, that's not really something a children's television presenter can be associated with. So after a year on how it was decided that... Uh, Gail would have to be replaced and we auditioned really hard really really hard to find someone and um, lots of people got close but when Gail McKenna walked into the room almost before she even said a word you know on camera in rehearsal we knew she was the right woman we, she just got on Fred and I and Gail it was like we'd known her forever I'd never met Gail before and that chemistry was there, and and that was the happiest team ever, I think. I mean, yes, of course, uh, Carol, Fred, and I got on really well. We're great, great pals, great allies um, with the foundation of Howe. But um, something about the relationship with uh, McKenna, Dianage, and Jones, where, uh, yeah, we, we'd still be doing Howe now if we could, given a chance. That would be great. That would, that would be fantastic if, if it was I'd still love going. To still be doing. That it. would be like the lo one of the longest uh, kids shows running if it was still going now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not. When did we do the first one? Nineteen eighty nine. So next year would be our thirtieth uh, anniversary. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? We did sixteen years, which is incredible. Because when I first did the pilot with with Fred, Fred said to me, "Toppy, old love." He used to call me Toppy because of my nickname, Gas Top. Um, Toppy, old love, how, how, how long do you reckon we'll, we'll, we'll get with how? I said, well, Freddie, I think if this is a success, I think we might do three years. 
and we ran for 16 years, which is unheard of in children's television. I don't. I think there are only two shows which have run longer than that. One is Blue Peter, and the other was Art Attack, which had a run of, uh, uh, I think, 17 years. I think possibly. Well, Art Attack moved to another channel, didn't it? It became a different show. But in terms of incumbents on one channel, I think how quite possibly is very close to the record or holds the record. I can't be certain. That's fair enough, and well done for uh, running for so long. Um, I have to say as well, um, I enjoyed it when you and Fred appeared a couple of years ago on a CITV documentary. You both seemed to be very proud of the show and reminiscing. That was a great watch, that was. Yeah, I've done a few um, sort of clip shows recently. Uh, I did When Kids TV Goes Horribly Wrong. Yes, I did, yeah, um, I saw that, yeah. Did something for was it fifty greatest kids programs, and then uh, there was a CITV anniversary as well. And I remember being interviewed about how to uh, and and saying how proud we were of how and 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 how I think Fred is responsible for the success of how. Fred's an extraordinary man. Uh, you know. He, countless years 40 50 years in television and you would swear whenever you go into the studio with fred this was the first time he'd ever been in the studio he has such fun he creates this spirit in the room where we're all laughing and enjoying it and teasing each other and that created the atmosphere on how which pervade through the television and i believe is the reason why how was successful Fred generated this mood, this mode under which we made the programs. And I'm very grateful to him for that. And he's just a great friend. You know, I I, I could trust Fred with my life. He's a, a reliable, close pal. And uh, I'm privileged to be able to say that. He's a, he's the, he is the nicest man in television, full stop. Nobody uh, have I ever worked with is, is greater than, than Fred, uh, and that's saying something. He is definitely a legend. Yeah, well, actually, no, Fred isn't a legend, because Fred's existence is verifiable and well-documented. I always say the difference between a legend and reality is that a legend is difficult to, to verify. You know, legend, ooh, Loch Ness, that's a legend. <laughs> But uh, Fred is verifiable. He's greater than a legend. He's real. This man actually happens, and I swear he's going to outlive me. He looks younger now than he did 20 years ago. He hasn't changed one bit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's it's great that the uh, friendship has continued. And I have to say, I watched that documentary when it went out a couple of years ago, and I have to say, that part of the show where you talked about how to was probably my favourite part of it, actually. Well, uh, it's very kind of you to say that, Jack. I'm... Uh, I think how is well remembered um, because we ran for such a long time. Uh, it was embedded in people's consciousness, and I think people invested in how. The clever thing about how was that we didn't just tell you stuff; we empowered the audience quite deliberately. In every episode of how, we would have at least one item that the audience could do themselves at home that involved something simple a piece of paper a pencil a paper clip you know you didn't have to go out and buy complicated chemicals or sticky back plastic which no one has in the house you know it, you could do this with stuff that you could walk into your kitchen and find and what that did was empower you because in the time that you weren't watching how you were doing stuff that you'd seen on how yourself and that builds your emotional connection with the program your sense of involvement so people who watched how didn't just watch how they took part in how it became an interactive program before we had interactive television and that builds that relationship that emotional investment and so when you remember how you don't just remember watching it you remember doing the things that you saw in how and the big bang was very much the same and uh and i'm very proud of that that People didn't just spend time watching my programs. They spend it, They spent time doing things that I showed them how to do. It transposed not just their entertainment time, but their real life as well. And that's a huge responsibility and something I'm enormously proud of and uh, kind of feel 
you know, a responsibility as a result of that. I know the power of television and uh, to be given that opportunity to do that was, was uh, a glorious privilege. Most definitely, and a, a great career. And, and the other thing as well, um, off the back of that documentary, they repeated a few of the old episodes as well. That must have been nice to uh, see again after all this time. I know. They ran uh, a couple of episodes of The Big Bang, or one episode of The Big Bang, and possibly two episodes of of How To. And it was amazing to see it again, because it was a snapshot of another age. You know, uh, for me watching old episodes of how I remember what my life was like in those days. It's more than just watching uh, a television program for me. It's like watching old family movies. And so it was deeply personal and very emotional. And I can't imagine what it would be like for an audience to see that, whether they remember that one episode going out or not. But, of course, I remember making that episode. You know, we spend days and weeks and hours um, getting it right uh, and so seeing it again is, is, is very rewarding, very rewarding. And, I, I, you know, it'd be wonderful if that show could be broadcast again. I wonder if there is a little channel somewhere who might like to run how. That would be great, wouldn't it? It would be great. I've always said it'd be great if there was a, a channel dedicated just to classic kids' telly. But uh, it hasn't come to fruition yet. Not yet. I think there's a, there's a slight uh, complication with the ownership of how. Uh, because... Uh, it was made by Scottish Television, and when ITV was consolidated uh, into, you know, from a group of independents to one large concern, that was an amalgam of Carlton and Granada. Uh, Scottish Television didn't join that. Neither did uh, Ulster Television, the other franchise holder. And so. Granada and Carlton don't own the rights to Howe in the way that they own all their other back catalogue. So that's one of the reasons that Howe isn't repeated very often, because it costs money. Whereas if you own it, it doesn't cost so much money. Uh, which is a great shame, really, uh, because uh, I'm sure a deal could be done after all these years, and I'm certain there's an audience for it. I, I think kids would enjoy Howe today. I think you know many of the ideas in that show are still valid today but hey i'm you know a, a new how would be equally valid too i suppose the one way the show can live on i'm sure you're aware many episodes exist on youtube for people to watch back yes people have uploaded uh episodes of how to youtube even i've uploaded uh, a compilation of the uh uh some of the better moments of the first three years of how together and i i cut it to a uh, uh, a Slade song called How Does It Feel? I edited all that on VHS back in oh, 1990, nothing at all. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, there are clips on there. So I suppose you can hunt them down. And, and people get their media in a very different way these days to television. Once upon a time, on-demand media didn't happen. And now, yeah, maybe maybe uh, Netflix or uh, Amazon should commission uh, an on-demand version of How. That would be the answer, wouldn't it? Definitely. Maybe a future project for your, for your company, perhaps. Maybe you're right, Jack. Maybe I need to work on that. <laughs> Write something down, make some, make some notes, get on with it. <laughs> no, I've come up with the idea, so I should get half the royalties. <laughs> At least, if not 90%. 90%, OK. Look, and that's a, that's, a, that's a binding contract. You said it on air. <laughs> yeah, OK, definitely. <laughs> I've got to ask, though, um, one final question about um, how to... In all the hows that you did over that 16 years, is there one that sticks out as your all-time favourite? Yeah, the two, two actually. Um, one was, um, how do you say, which is the name of a town in, in a little village in North Wales. Being a Welshman... Any excuse to talk about Wales on television made me enormously proud. And that how was chosen for the programme because I can say... And so can Carol, because Carol Vorderman is Welsh too. Uh, and we had to teach Fred, who's from Erdington, a Brummie, uh, we had to teach him how to say it. And we broke it down into small elements. And it was enormous pride for me to teach someone to say that. And to teach... An audience of six and a half million people 
almost all of them non-Welsh speakers, how to say that, makes me enormously proud. That one was one of them. And the other one, which I think was probably the most useful, practical how I've ever done, uh, which was uh, about toilet paper. Uh, I think it was called How Can You Tell the Top from the Bottom? And um, it, it's a how, you may remember, uh, if you've ever been to the toilet and you, you sit down and you, you reach out for some toilet paper and the uh, two plies of the toilet paper have become separated. They're two very thin pieces rather than one thicker two-ply piece. And the reason for this is that the serrations which separate every single page, if you like, panel of, of, of toilet roll, have become misaligned. They don't line up on top of each other anymore. They're slightly out of phase. And the reason for this is that the bottom sheet of the two-ply has become the top sheet. In other words, someone has torn one of those ply off and wrapped it round. So the, 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 the answer is to separate the two plies again, take the top one, roll it back round the toilet roll whilst holding the bottom one until the two lines of serration line up again. And then when you pull the next one off, you get a two-ply toilet roll than a single one. Of course, as we all know, with a single ply, your finger goes through the paper, and you don't want that for obvious reasons. So probably the most practical, useful, and hygienic how we ever did, and that one will stay with me forever. It's funny, actually, you mentioned the one about the Welsh name, and I'm not going to attempt it. Um, (laughs) Funnily enough, about four or five years ago, I was watching... Um, how-to clips on YouTube and that one was on there and I tried to do it and I, I kind of got it but um, oh, I didn't succeed I, did, I got yeah, there a almost a little practice break it down it's, it's the same as anything like presenting like learning a new skill break it down into its component parts bit by bit practice those bits so when you put them together the whole thing comes together I mean everyone can say every single one of the elements with practice in that word all you have to do is then put them together one after the other llan fair pwll gwyn gill go ger y chwyrn drobwll llan tisilio o go goch not that difficult <laughs> Easy for you to say. Um, well, I've had 57 years practice. <laughs> Definitely. Um, it's funny, actually, I've literally just had a, a text message through off a, a friend who knows that I'm talking to you today, and he's just asked me, can you ask Gareth what was the weirdest how he remembers? Weirdest how? Wow. Do you know what? That's such a great question. I've never been asked that question before. The weirdest how? Um... Bear with me. I'm giving okay. this some serious thought, Jack. Um, we did a a story about Baden Powell, if I remember. Baden Powell was the man who founded the Scouts organization, and I think the story was uh, about him being a spy which I didn't realize before he founded the, the, the Scouts, he was a spy. He was sent off somewhere um, officially as a, um, uh, what's the word? Is he entomologist, someone who um, studies insects? He was sent somewhere to draw butterflies that he'd found somewhere. But in fact, buried in his drawings of these butterflies were details, information about somewhere that he was surveying for the British government. And he was a spy, which is kind of weird. I mean, that was a a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant how, where we revealed something that people didn't know. That was the joy of how, where we empowered people with facts. And and I I, I can't remember the details, because this was Fred's how, not mine. But if you studied these drawings of his butterflies, you could decode them. There was information buried in them. And that's pretty weird, isn't it? Burying detail in, in paintings of butterflies. So off the top of my head, I would say that one. But I'm sure there were weirder hours, but I can't quite recall just at the moment. Well, thank you for answering that question for my friend. Hey, you're very welcome. What's your friend's name? His name's John. 
John. Great question. No one has ever asked me that, John. And those are the best questions. Actually, I've got in my attic all the scripts for the 16 years of how all the running orders, all the, the research notes and items. Uh, I may be tempted one day to go through them and, and try and find some weirder hows, and I'll give you a proper answer to that question. I'll give John a proper answer. <laughs> well, no problem. Thank you very much for that. That would be, uh, be great to hear. I need an excuse to look at them. I mean, you know, I put them there at the end of every series, and I haven't looked at them since, but it's now... Uh, well, we finished How in 2005, so that's, what, 13 years since I last looked at a How script. Maybe it's time to have a look. I want to ask you as well about a couple of other kids shows that you did. Um, the other one that you did around about the same time was uh, The Big Bang, which is very similar to How To. Was that yep. enjoyable to do? Oh, utter joy. Utter, utter joy. Um, the beauty of How was that it was an established format a program that I used to watch and knew as a child. And so we had to sort of adhere to uh, the existing shape of that program, which was great. But the, the beauty of the Big Bang was that this was a new show which was conceived from scratch, and I was in there from scratch. So in some ways I helped write the template for the Big Bang, and it was very much built around the skills uh, that I brought to the program with with Kate Bellingham, my co-presenter for the first couple of series, and, and 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 it was I was slightly more liberated on on the Big Bang. Big Bang was more of a science show. How is often described as a science show, but really it's a children's encyclopedia. We did everything from art, history, sociology, and and very much science. But the Big Bang was a pure science show. Uh, and and the the other joy of, of the Big Bang was after a couple of years with Kate Bellingham, who I adored and was a great pal, uh, my great friend for 10 years, uh, Violet Berlin, joined the program as my co-presenter. And then after a couple of years, Violet and I got together as a couple. Uh, and so I was presenting the program with my great love. And uh, it felt completely natural. There was a no real delineation between my life on television and my real life at that point. And, of course, Violet and I got together. We've had children, and here we are some uh, 19 years later still together. So I have a lot to thank The Big Bang for. You know, it, 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 although Violet was my friend, it, was, it, it working with Violet um, put us close together and brought us together as a, as a couple, you know. So, yeah. Loved doing the Big Bang. It was made in Yorkshire. My um, dad, even though my parents are both Welsh, my father was brought up in, in Doncaster in Yorkshire. So I knew Yorkshire well. Uh, I used to spend my summer holidays there with my grandparents as a child. So going to Yorkshire to work in some ways felt like coming home. It felt very familiar. Uh, and I was very happy to be in Yorkshire. Um, happy days. Yeah, love the Big Bang. You know, I got to do some ridiculous things on the Big Bang, stuff I could never do on How To. I mean, I jumped out of an aircraft and skydived at 11,000 feet. I went gliding on How To, on, on the Big Bang, excuse me. I, um, I, I rode and very nearly killed myself in a very high-speed hydroplane on uh, the Big Bang. Uh, yeah, I did lots of physical stuff on the Big Bang, which I love doing. Great stuff and great story as well. And, and congratulations to uh, you and Violet. Sounds like a, a really happy story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, people do meet their partners through work, and uh, inevitably, uh, I, I, you know, I met Violet. I'm no wonder we got on. We'd known each other for ten years. You know, we've been great mates for ten years. And uh, when we did finally get together, all our pals went, "Yeah, like that should have happened ten years ago." <laughs> we had no idea, of course. It was really obvious to them, not to us. <laughs> um, yeah, because that—that that was the thing. She um, presented Bad Influence, didn't she, on on CITV? Yes, Violet was a gamer. She uh, had a passion for video games and had done uh, a program based in Yorkshire, made by Yorkshire Television, called uh, Bad Influence, uh, which is why Yorkshire Television considered Violet as the. Uh, presenter on the big bang when kate bellingham uh left to have a baby um uh, violet was their suggestion uh, as the uh, presenter and i'm very glad that she was 
because uh, she fitted great on 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 the Big Bang. And Violet wasn't a science and en- engineer in in terms of background. So whereas I came to the program knowing the answers, Violet came to the program with great questions, and those great questions made it easier to understand, made it better television for an an audience who didn't have a knowledge of science and engineering. There's nothing worse sometimes than having two experts on the screen because it will disengage you from the audience. But having someone who knows about this sort of stuff on screen and some on screen and someone who has uh, the ability to ask the right questions makes for a programme with better dialogue. There was something I was going to mention. Something popped up on, on YouTube a, a little while ago. Um, it was a, a crossover thing between How To, Art Attack, Bad Influence and Animal Crazy and the four of you switched presenting roles. That's on YouTube at the minute. Yeah, it was called How Crazy Bad Attack, I think. And guess what? It was produced by Tim Edmonds, uh, who was the producer of Art Attack, as mentioned before, and the first series of How To, the man responsible for bringing How To back with Nigel Picard, and the producer of of Get Fresh. And yeah, it was to celebrate some anniversary uh, for CITV, and it would be a great idea. We thought it would be a great idea to mix us all up. And um, uh, I'd met Violet, I think, in about 1989 or 1990 when I appeared on a program she was doing in Granada uh, for satellite television. Uh, And then I presented alongside uh, Violet um, we all swapped I think I got to do um, uh, the animal program and uh, uh, Violet got to do how with Andy Crane and we all mixed each other's shows up and and Fred uh, got to do a, a bad influence section not knowing anything about video games <laughs> I've it seen it hilarious. and it is absolutely hilarious to watch yeah. and also because Fred- um, Carol does Art Attack and deliberately puts on a fake Scouse yeah. accent yeah yeah I remember <laughs> that it was we were all howling in CDA it was a great day it was a very happy day. And we, you know, we, we do know each other. In children's television, you occasionally get to work together. But this was one day where we're all in the same space. And it was a joy. Absolutely hilarious. I haven't seen that for a long time. It's on YouTube. I didn't realise. Going back to the Big Bang, the one, the one other thing I wanted to ask, actually, um, the show continued for a few years without you and Violet. Why was this? Why did you leave the show? Well, we, Violet and I had got together and had babies is what went wrong. Uh, <laughs> not that it went okay. wrong. But um, we did uh, one series with um, our oldest son, Tycho, uh, at about 10 months old. And it's very difficult making a television program where you've got to be up at you know, 5, 6 in the morning and you work until 6 in the evening when you've got a little baby toddler. Um you know, Violet and I never used nannies, but we did have someone come with us up to Leeds to try and help us make the program and uh, look after Tycho while we were literally on screen in the studio and the rest of the time we'd be looking after him. And it worked out. We did it and it was okay, but it was very hard. It was exhausting and I don't think Tycho got the uh, attention he deserved as a baby from from us. And then uh, very shortly after that, Violet uh, became pregnant again with our second son, Indy. Indy was going to be born, I think, a couple of weeks after the production of uh, The Big Bang would have happened. So uh, Violet would have been eight and a half months pregnant whilst we were making The Big Bang which would have been difficult. That would have been very difficult. You know, uh, movement, you can't sleep very well you, when you're, you're that pregnant. And we had a baby. And and so Violet stepped down. She says, look, I, I can't do the Big Bang when I'm this pregnant. Not this year. Maybe next year we, when we've got the babies, maybe we'll, we'll consider it. And uh, I thought long and hard, do I really want to do the Big Bang with someone else instead of Violet? Not sure I do. Um, there was a change of producer as well on that program. The people who'd made the program previously weren't been making it that year, so it would have been a, a learning progress and a very different program. 
And I wasn't ready to take that sort of risk to the Big Bang. And so I showed a bit of solidarity with Violet and my family. And I said, no, I'm, I think it's, I, I'll call it a day. I'll step down from the Big Bang and I'm going to work on something with Violet. We're going to go to London and we've been developing another program anyway, a, a show called uh, Try This, Don't Slash Don't Try This, um, which was uh, a children's program to encourage people to do activities. And we'd had some interest in that program, so we were developing that idea, and we'd set up a production company to develop it called Whiz Bang Television. Uh, you know, taking the Big Bang, taking the bang from Big Bang, showing a bit of continuity. And uh, we'd also been offered uh, some interest uh, to make a program about video games. So I decided rather than go up to Yorkshire and spend three months in Yorkshire with two toddlers, you know, ship out of London, our home, that wouldn't be practical. I'd step out of the Big Bang. Uh, Violet and I would set up a production office within 100 yards of our home here in London, and we'd do some pre-production work on uh, this program for Bravo called Gamepad about video games. Uh, and that wouldn't be in the period when Violet was pregnant, but after the baby was born. So, yeah, we we, made, we moved to London. Well, we, we, we lived in London, but we moved production to London. And we started making Gamepad, which we made three series of, uh, which I was the producer-director of, and Violet was the producer and presenter and writer of Gamepad. So uh, that was kind of my, uh, with what do they call it? Well, withdrawal plan, if you like, from television being a presenter. I, I suddenly found myself as a director-producer and uh, was terrified absolutely terrified i'd never really been given the full responsibility for a program on my own before uh although i had done some directing and had often produced items on all the television programs i'd made suddenly i was the boss and it was very satisfying working with violet continuing that relationship and uh yeah i learned a lot in those periods so that's why i left the big bang babies and it was time to do something a bit nearer home well, like you said, always have a backup plan when the TV work finishes. Yeah, you need you need a, a plan, and uh, you know, television as a presenter is only a full time career for a small percentage of the people who become presenters. It's quite easy to be given an opportunity to do it for a short while, but to make a full career out of it, you have to have the wind behind you. So, having an escape plan is a good idea. The other thing as well, um, not only did you do a lot of shows based around science and, and technology, um, I remember you did a show called Mega Maths as well. Was yes. you always into maths at well, school? Well, <laughs> I had a great maths teacher in school. Um, uh, Gomer Davis was my physics teacher. Aled Jones was my maths teacher. Two very passionate Welsh people. And I learned maths and physics and biology in Welsh, I was educated through the medium of the Welsh language. And, um, yeah, maths is an extension of, of, of you know, oh, science, engineering and technology and maths do cross over. I was offered uh, mega maths from the BBC um, because there was a certain amount of... Um, actually, it started, I'm just thinking about it, it started with the uh, Maths Sphere Special, which... Uh, explain mathematics through the medium of science, engineering, and technology. We, we studied aircraft and had to explain how um, mathematics was important if you were a pilot or a, a designing a, an aircraft or even the person fueling the aircraft. Uh, and so that was how I got involved with the people who made Mega Maths through Maths Sphere Special. It was the same group of people in uh, BBC's uh, education schools department who made uh, Mega Maths. Yeah, and I came into Mega Maths. I played the Joker, a kind of a, uh, a caricature, an act, you know, a act, semi-acting role, really. Where um, it was fun. It was fun. I did a few series of that. Uh, when was that? Been ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand, something like that, I think. And we made quite a lot of them. Um, a great pleasure to work with the BBC, who you know, I, I most of my work has been with ITV, but I have done stuff with the Beeb over the years, and it was a pleasure working with the Beeb again on that. 
Yeah, from what I, I'm trying to remember the show myself. Actually, it was a friend of mine brought it up. I do remember it. Um, it was, was it set in a castle or something like that? It was kind of had like a medieval theme. To, exactly, yeah. it was set in a medieval uh, castle, and all the characters were sort of uh, the king, the queen, the jack. It was based around the card, a pack of cards theme. Uh, you know, the House of Diamonds, the House of Clubs. It was a bit like Game of Thrones, and uh, <laughs> and I was the Joker, but I refused to wear tights. I wasn't going to turn up and be a joker in a pair of curly shoes, <laughs> uh, a hat with bells on it and, and tights. I said, look, I'll do this, but I'm not going to be that sort of joker. But I will be the joker from Batman because that's cool. <laughs> and they said, OK, why not? So they put me in a kind of a zoot suit, like the sort of thing the joker used to wear, a big, uh, is it a, what do they call it, a Homburg hat? What do they call those sort of hats and a big pinstripe suit? And whilst everyone around me was medieval, I was wearing like a 1930s outfit. It made no sense whatsoever, <laughs> but it didn't seem to matter. And I ran the games, the mathematics games with the kids, teaching kids how to uh, count with money and add up and use coins. It was great fun. And then I had some role play to do with some puppets, gargoyles, which was terrific. They were uh, well-written, good puppets, very funny. Happy days. Oh, great answer to that question. Um, the other thing as well, around about the time How To finished, I do remember, because you presented Get Fresh, um, you were invited onto Ministry of Mayhem. What was it like doing a Saturday morning telly show again? I was only a guest on that. I'd, I'd always been guest on guests on other Saturday morning programmes. There was always a handover thing that happened. Um when the in the last episode of Get Fresh, in which was sort of late August, next week number seventy three would take over in our slot. You know, a studio show for the winter. You can't do a location show in Britain in the weather that we have in Britain during the winter, only during the summer. So we'd hand over to seventy three. So the seventy three presenters would be a guest on on Get Fresh. And similarly, in the last episode of seventy three in um, March. Uh, we'd appear, the presenters of Get Fresh would appear as a guest on 73. And so it wasn't unusual appearing on other people's Saturday morning shows. And uh, Ministry of Mayhem, I think I was a guest on it twice. I think there was quite a lot of uh, mess involved. There were there was, there was some, um, there were lots of flanning and all that kind of thing. We never really did that guns thing on Get Fresh. Uh, but it was nice to be gunged on other people's programmes, and uh, I seem to remember being gunged on that. Uh, I think who, who was on that? I think Gail um, Porter was on that yeah, at one point. I think yeah. I think she was on because she did Scratchy and Co. I think Neil was on because of Number Seventy Three. Yeah, um, Sally James from Tiz was as well. I'm trying Lovely to remember. Lovely Sally James. Yes, I I remember now. We all stayed in the same hotel in um, Maidstone in Kent. Uh, and at the same time, I just started doing some motorsport television as well. Um, I was the pit lane reporter for A1 Grand Prix, which was like a, like Formula One, a motor uh, series, an international motor racing series. And the week before, the race had been at Brands Hatch, and I'd be staying in that very same hotel in Maidstone. <laughs> it's a small world. Definitely. Yeah, I remember I remember it well. I think you were all put in a cage and had guns thrown at you. I think you were the only one who wouldn't wear um, a cagoule, if That's I remember right. right. That's absolutely right. If you're going to get guns, you get guns. You don't hide behind plastic. It was a tribute to uh, Tiswas, one of the, well, arguably the greatest, coolest Saturday morning programme ever, where Tiswas ran in the late 70s, early 80s. I used to watch it. And, uh, yeah, celebrities were put in a cage and gunged mercilessly. And, yeah, I, I got to be gunged a la... Tis was. Great fun. Great fun, definitely. So since the days in, in kids' telly, um, what have you been up to? I mean, I understand you, you do a podcast yourself. Yes, yes, I've been podcasting uh, for 14 years now. Um, I'm one of the first tranche, if you like, of uh, podcasts in the UK um, were I was involved with. Um, my, uh, my mate... Um, uh, Zog, his real name is, is Paul Ierson. Uh, Zog uh, came up to me one day and said, I know what you've got to do now that How To is over. I said, what? He said, 
you've got to make a podcast. I said, okay, great. What's a podcast? I had no idea. This would have been uh, 2005, I suppose, 2004, um, was it? I can't even remember. And um, Oh, yeah, 2005, because how it just finished. And uh, Zog explained what a podcast was, how it worked. I said, okay, what's it going to be about? Um, what we're going to call it? He said, well, it's going to be about motorsports and cars because I, you know, this is the passion that Zog and I shared. We used to go to races together and watch races together and discuss motorsport. Uh, uh, and it's going to be called Gareth Jones on Speed. So it was Zog's idea to call it that and Zog's idea for what the content would be. And we went to Silverstone and recorded an episode at the uh, British Grand Prix. Um, and that was the first episode. And over the years, it's grown to be a, a regular program that's updated every fortnight now, um, where I discuss motorsport and cars with my friend Zog and a chap called Richard Porter, who is the script writer for uh, the, Grand, the Grand Tour and previously Top Gear. So he's a very funny, very talented man who really knows his cars and, and a great friend. Um, we've been doing it together now for 14 years. Um, there are an, a variety of uh, shows in Gareth Jones on Speed. We do what we call like a studio show where the three of us stand up together and talk about cars and uh, write and record sketches and songs about uh, cars, uh, parodies, you know. And, uh, and then I do uh, reports from motor races. We go to Le Mans every year and a number of other motor races and um, we go to exhibitions like the bond in motion exhibition which features lots of cars or the british motor show or an international motor show or i review cars where i you know a car is delivered to my house something interesting like an aston martin or a tesla and i get in it with my recorder and i drive off and i review the car so it's a very broad church gareth jones on speed but it's very popular it's become the uh, number one British made car podcast in the iTunes store because any uh, programs which chart above us are usually American made. So I'm very, 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 very proud of the fact that many years after How and the Big Bang and Get Fresh, I'm having another hit. And uh, Gareth Jones on Speed continues to be a success. You know, we the download figures are climbing on a daily basis, uh, and that's wonderful and deeply satisfying. Congratulations for uh, doing a successful podcast for, for so many years. Thank you. It's a wonderful thing, podcasting. It's quite a commitment. If you've got content, you've got ideas to share, and you can get it to an audience, and the audience starts supporting it, uh, it's a wonderful, deeply, deeply, deeply satisfying thing. Definitely. Um, so uh, the other thing as well, um, if anyone wants to find out more about what you're doing these days, um, do you have a website or social media people can follow? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. It's plug time. Yeah, <laughs> my website is garethjones.tv, of course. Uh, and there's a full account of uh, Gareth Jones on Speed you can get from there. You, you can get Gareth Jones on Speed from the iTunes store or indeed any podcast aggregator like Acast, um, just search Gareth Jones on Speed. On social media, on Twitter, I'm Gareth Jones TV. On Instagram, I'm Gareth Jones TV. Uh, on Facebook, um, search Gareth Jones Gaz Top, I think it is, or is it Gareth Gaz Top Jones? I can't even remember. Uh, yeah, you'll find out everything I do. Go go to my website. It's all on my website, garethjones.tv, and there are links there. Or Twitter. I'm most active on Twitter. I do use Instagram and Facebook, but I'm most active on Twitter. And you'll hear about the various other projects I do. I make radio documentaries these days through my production company, Wizbang, which I uh, present and write and produce. Uh, we've made shows about um, cars, uh, Welsh cars. We've made shows about rock and roll about roadies, about venues, uh, about a great number of uh, subjects. I'm just about in the middle at the moment of pitching a whole tranche. I keep saying tranche, don't I? I must stop saying that, repeating myself. A whole group of pitches for a new batch of programmes, which I'm submitting to the BBC, which hopefully I'll make uh, in the next 12 months, which you'll hear about. I 
I'm forbidden from describing anything about mm-hmm. them at the moment. Uh, uh, not that I've signed a non-disclosure agreement. It's just that I think it's bad luck to talk about things which are in the pitching process. But um, I made a, a documentary recently, uh, a video, a short video film about the Ford Cortina. That's on YouTube. That's been a huge hit. I made that for the Influx website. But if you go to YouTube and search the Ford Cortina and me you'll find it um that's a lovely little film i'm very proud it's one of the proudest things one of the most lovely things i've been involved in for years uh it's a beautiful beautifully shot i didn't make that myself through my production company there's another production company who made that um made it with dave vitty chap used to be comedy dave on radio one in the morning a lovely and very talented man and we'll be doing more and uh, I've got a film coming up soon about, um, well, it's about the difference between torque and brake horsepower and involves a huge lorry and a supercar, quite possibly a Bugatti Veyron. But more on that as it emerges. It's bad luck to talk about it. Yeah, a few projects coming soon, uh, including one involving swimming across Wales. But I can't say any more than that. It would be bad luck. So go and check them out when they uh, come out. Yeah, GarethJones.tv is the place to go, and you'll find links to all my social media there. Thank you very much for having me, Jack. Unbelievable that you've watched so many of my programmes. Bless you. (laughs) Appreciate that. Not a problem. So I've got one final question for you, or a final request, rather, to uh, finish off this chat. I was wondering, could we have one final how for now? (laughs) Well, yes. Well, maybe I should tell you the story um, uh, briefly. Um, when we did the pilot for How, me, How To, I should say, me, Fred, and Carl Vorderman in 1989, we got to the end of the last item in the show, which, if I remember, was a how about um, how can you sit down in a swamp without getting muddy, and it's a how whereby you sit on someone's knees, and that person whose knees you are sitting on sits on someone's knees, and you form a circle. So everybody's sitting on their own knees, uh, and, and you can sit down without sitting in mud, uh, for instance. Uh, so we did the how, and Fred did, and that's how you can sit on uh, down without getting muddy. Goodbye. <laughs> and it was sort of awkward. It didn't seem right. So I came up with this phrase. I said, Fred, why don't you just do, you know, that's how you can sit down without getting muddy, and that's how for now. And everyone went, oh, yeah, that, that's great. It worked. So we did it in the pilot, and we did it at the end of every episode of the 16 years of how I just, you know, something I came up with. I'm good at catchphrases, I think, and I came up with that um, on a whim. And I'm very proud that whenever I'm walking down the street, you know, people raise their hand and they see me and they go, oh, how for now? And it makes me smile that that one moment in a porter cabin in Kent in 1989 persists to this day. So I shall do it now. And that's, that's, uh, that's how my career in television started, middled, and in some ways continues. And uh, that's how, for now, because we may yet return, you never know. Or certainly how they return. I hope so, anyway. 